This very interesting gospel text appears only in the book of John. It's the very end, it's the last chapter in the gospel of John, chapter 21. There are various nuances which are typical of John. The 153 fish are meant to be signifying there are 153 nations, pagan nations, which surrounded them, and they were all part of the great net, which is meant to be symbolic of the church. The mission of the church would be to all nations. Um, the fire has its own significance that I will mention in a few moments. Uh, it's the third time that Jesus appears. In the last few Sundays, we had the first and second time. They were in the upper room, remember? And the second time they were with Thomas was with them in the upper room. And this is the third time that Jesus appears to them. It happens at a place called Tagba on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I know that many of you here are pilgrims and you have been to Tagba. It's a mystical place. Um, the fishing happens only in the upper quarter, the northern quarter of the Sea of Galilee. It's, sea of Galilee is 14 miles from top to bottom, seven and a half miles across the center, but fishing only in the north because there are warm springs that come in there and these warm springs attract the fish. So it fits historically that they would go fishing in that area. This is the same area, by the way, where they were called when they were first called from being fishermen to be followers of Jesus. Now, what does this mean? I start going to Tagba 30 some years ago, and I found it a mystical place. It has many teachings, and I preach many times about this experience at Tagba, about the Greek and the words for love in Greek, but I want to vary that today because you have heard that many times in the past. I want to look at it in a different way. I often said to myself, if there's a place I could choose to die, I'd probably like to die at Tagba. Not because of the mystical, the beauty of the area, but because of the teaching, extraordinary teaching in this event at Tagba. So let me speak for a few moments about the teaching. In all the times I've gone there, I'm convinced that I read this gospel before. I didn't read it in a book. I read it in my own life. This gospel appeared to me in my own human experience. And here's how I'd like to invite you to reflect on it. Look back over your life. And remember with me some moment of collapse in your life, some significant bad decision you made, some error, perhaps a sin, where you betrayed yourself, your best self. Perhaps it was an addiction you were struggling with. Look back over your life and remember that moment it's defining. It's an important moment to remember in your life. It may be a moment, it may be a passage in your life. This is the time when you felt less, you were diminished, you felt empty. Somehow there was darkness in your life. You felt a certain shame, embarrassment, maybe a certain fear in your life. It was not something you wished to discuss. You wished to share with anyone. You didn't even wish to share it with yourself. You buried it deep inside yourself. You didn't want to discuss it in a conversation even with yourself. It's out of embarrassment or the fear of rejection you didn't share, and it became the secret that wasn't shared. 
and the secret that wasn't shared becomes a great burden. It's buried somewhere deep inside, and until I share it, I have this compulsion to share this collapse in my life. Now, we may have some perfect people here who never had such an experience. I am not one of those. So you bury this, it becomes a secret that you haven't shared. But there's a compelling energy inside of you to address this, to bring it to the surface, to share it. For without sharing it, you can't be healed. Without looking at it and owning it, there is no freedom. It somehow incarcerates you. And the deeper you bury it, the more of a burden it becomes. It will come back to haunt you. And then, compelled by the need to share it, you find a trusted venue, a place of confidence. It may be a confessional moment. It may be with a close friend. But you share this burden which is deep inside of you. And your trusted friend reassures you that your failure does not define your life. You are reassured that you're worthy, that you're a good person. You hear a voice saying, but you are lovable. In all your humanity, you are lovable. And somebody blesses you with this affirmation. It blesses you with a renewed confidence and belief in yourself. Somehow, you are reborn. You find a new space, a new freedom, a new sense of self-value in your life. And you are reborn from a place of darkness and called into a place of light. I have a good friend, a priest, who is in the 12-step program. And he will tell you that the greatest gift that God gave him is his addiction. Now that he's in recovery, he's more compassionate, more understanding, he's less judgmental, he's more patient with people's weakness because he saw his own poverty and somehow he went through an acceptance of this and a healing and a claim to new life. This is exactly what happens in this gospel reading today. There's a charcoal fire here. Peter is lost. His dream is gone. His whole vision, his whole sense of meaning in life is crushed. He hoped that Jesus would be the one and his dream was crushed. He's empty, he's impoverished, uh, he's lost. Just like someplace we might have been lost. And we say, we'll go fishing. We'll be distracted. We'll do something. So he goes back to his old life, having abandoned his hopes and his dreams. And Jesus comes into his life again. There's a charcoal fire here. You will remember at the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, there was a charcoal fire. And before that fire, at the house of Caiaphas, Peter looked in the face of Jesus and denied that he knew him three times. And now, with a charcoal fire, he will declare his love for the one he once denied. Before the charcoal fire, in claiming his love, he accepts his failure. He understands his sin. He sees his humanity. And in the healing, forgiving presence of God's infinite love in Jesus Christ, he is set free. 
feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He is restored. He has given you life. Read the life of Peter and you'll find in the fifth chapter of Luke's Gospel the call of Peter. It's different than the other Gospels. Luke says that Jesus went with them when they were fishing and they caught a great miraculous catch of fish. Peter is so impressed he goes down on his knees before Jesus and he says, leave me for I am a sinful man. Jesus calls him in his sin and says, from now on, you will be a fisher of people. The 22nd chapter of Luke's Gospel has another insight into Peter, where Jesus looks at him, the leader, and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has sought to take you and to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And after you have repented, then you will strengthen your brothers. You must fail, and then you must repent. And only then can you preach the gospel. It's an extraordinary summons to every one of us that we are reborn from a place of darkness. We are uplifted from a place of failure or a place of sin. We are set free from a place of deceit or a betrayal to somehow we are given new life in the risen Lord. Marvelous revelation that touches perhaps everybody's life or at least most people's lives. Pause with me for a moment, a moment of silent prayer, and remember the moment in your life, or maybe the time in your life, when you betrayed your best self, when you collapsed, when you entered into a place of darkness, the secret, the place of the secret. The secret which was not shared. Pause for a moment and remember and be conscious of the infinite embrace of God's love for you, only to be experienced truly in a time of darkness. Pause for a moment of prayer. Here again, the wonder of God's revelation in the infinite love given to us in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, calling us to new life in freedom and in glory. Amen.